Hello everyone and welcome to our video about facilitating a young person's transition at school. To introduce ourselves first, my name is Dr Aoife Neary and I am lecturer in Sociology of Education at the School of Education, University of Limerick. And this is... And I'm Hannah Solly and I'm the Family Support and Education Officer in Tenney, the Transgender Equality Network of Ireland. So Hannah and I, along with Dr. Rory Santiago McBride, as part of our Caroline IRC Marie Curie funded project, have designed an e-resource and workbook for teachers entitled Gender Identity and Gender Expression in Schools. And this e-resource is housed on the University of Limerick website. So this short video is designed to accompany section 11 of that e-resource, and that is steps to take in facilitating a young person's transition at school. Within the website and the accompanying worksheet, we've provided a transition checklist to aid schools in working with a young person who is transitioning at school to build an action plan and time frame. So in our conversation now, Hannah will take us through the checklist, capturing the advice that Tenny gives to schools. Okay, so let's start from the beginning. Hannah, can you take us through the first steps in supporting the young person? Yeah, I think that um, the very first step um, when a a young person has reached the stage where they want to socially transition in school, it's important for the school to arrange um, a meeting with the young person, with um, their adults, um, carers, parents from home, and, um, and the people who are necessary within the school, so possibly the principal and the guidance counsellor. Um, and in this meeting, um, it's important to design a transition plan and a timeline for when each part of um, the transition will take place. Um, the main point of this is that the young person needs to be central to the decision making. So there shouldn't be any decisions that are made to do with the transition within the school where the young person has not um, participated in that. Um, and that, I think that's the key point really. And in the first stage of the um, checklist that we've designed, um, there's a section for student details and background. So what kind of student details and background might be recorded there? I suppose the most prominent is probably going to be a name and pronoun change, um, which would occur with most young people, but not all. And I think that's an important um, point to make as well, is that you know everybody's transition is going to be slightly different. Yes, there are going to be commonalities through most social transitions, but because we're all unique individuals, each one is going to be slightly different. And that's why it's also really important to have that meeting and to, to really ask the student. So there's possibly going to be a name and pronoun change. And um, if there is, then um, that's going to be needed to be changed on the administration, on the student records for internal use. So um, that's why it's important to get a time frame for when that happens, just so that the school can be prepared, so that it can be changed on the roll calls and the internal ad administration. And in terms of communication with teachers and staff then, how would you and Tenny be advising this would happen? I think that, um, you know, uh, it's going to be important for staff to be told because obviously that student is going to be moving around um, different classes and all of the staff um, and teachers need to know that so that they can be prepared. So I would um, generally imagine it would happen during a staff meeting. Um, usually there's one of these at least once a week in, in most schools, possibly more in some schools. So it's for the principal to decide um, you know which staff meeting that's going to be um, that's going to be um, in and um, it's just a point of reference with all other information so we have a student they are currently you know in um, our school under this name but as of either next week or two weeks time that that name is going to change and the pronoun is also going to change and who who else beyond the staff would need to be communicated with in the school community um, again, this can be decided um, in that meeting with the student and it can be, um, you know, part of the transition plan and, and this will change. So, again, this is why it's really important to ask the student, um, do they want their peers to be told? Um, I, I think it is probably, um, it it's, would be best practice for young people to know, um, just so that there is no confusion. But it's the way that this is done, I think, is the important part. And a lot of the time, um, students want to do it themselves. Um, and that's okay. 
possibly they have already told um, all of their friends before they've even approached the school about wanting to make a social transition. So it's about the other peers in the form, tutor group, and the rest of the school year, and how that's done depends on how the student wants it done. So if they want to just let the information kind of organically spread through the school, then that's, that's the way it should be done. If they would prefer that their form tutor is informed and they don't want to do it, then um, it probably comes down to the tutor to do that, that form group's tutor. And um, you know, when it's going to be done is also can also be done in the transition plan. Is that at the beginning of the week? Is it at the end of the week? And it should be just short um, and simple. Um, you're really um, outlining um, the, the changes that students um, are going to see happen, which is predominantly probably a pronoun and name change. Um, and that you're looking for their support in this. It shouldn't be a lesson on gender diversity. It doesn't need to be, you know, um, a, a long piece of information, short and sweet. And what about if the young person has a sibling in the school? Yeah, I think that a lot of the time siblings can be um, forgotten about, but they are um, part of the journey, I suppose, for that young person. And they do need to be taken into consideration. They may not need any support at all, but I think it's really important and that they will feel really, um, you know, valued if just if their tutor or, or the principal or vice principal, whoever is deemed the person to do that, checks in with them and just says, oh, you know, we know that you're so-and-so's um, brother or sister and we just want to check that you're okay um, this is when these things are going to be happening um, do you need any support from us um, and and if even if you don't need any support right now please do know that if you feel like you do need support in the future you, you can you can come and ask us and should parents of other children you know how how wide does this information go I think in a post-primary school, the only people who need to be told are the students who are going to be in direct contact with um, the student who's transitioning. No, I don't think it's necessary to tell parents, and I certainly don't think it's necessary to tell um, to uh, tell other um, students in the school who are in other years um, who may not even come into contact with the, with the student. I think there's lots of sensitive information that the school has on certain students. We don't divulge that information to the whole school community. And, you know, I would see this just like that. This is one, um, you know, thing that's happening within the school and everybody doesn't need to know that. You mentioned administrative records in the school. So what records might need to be changed and what would you advise uh, schools in relation to this? Yeah, I mean, um, I suppose each school is slightly different and they will know best, but certainly on the roll call for all of the classes, anyone who's going to be reading out names, um, you know, that, that name needs to be changed on, on that list and any um, internal administration um, and, and documents um, should be changed just so that that student, um, you know, whenever they pick up a piece of information, it has their, their preferred name and pronoun on that piece of paper. Yeah. And another aspect then of school life that's of course uh, really important are um, um, the toilet facilities and the changing facilities in the school. Again, what would you advise in relation to this? Um, again, it's coming back to the students and asking them um, what their preference is, what makes them feel most comfortable and what their needs are. So uh, quite often, but not always, but, but quite often when a student is um, in the middle of making a social transition in school, they may prefer a um, universal access toilet, a single cubicle toilet, um, and that might make them feel more comfortable in the interim. And quite a lot of the time, those students, once they have transitioned and they have um, got used to living their authentic self within the school system, they will want to transition into using the, the toilets that um, align with their gender identity um, and they should be allowed to do that. At the same time, some students want to transition um, immediately to the toilet facilities that align with their gender identity. And if that is what makes them feel comfortable and that's what they prefer, they should be allowed to do that too. And what about PE, physical education or, and sports facilities, changing facilities? Yeah, I think the same as, um, as the toilet facilities. Um, I think it's important for schools to consider whether they have um, a, a gender neutral or a single access 
um, cubicle that, that's um, of use to students. And if they don't, how can they achieve this and make this happen? Because, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it will happen at some stage, I think, in most schools. So I think that having all options available and then asking the student um, which is their preferred option and then how do we um, facilitate this? How do we, we make it accessible for them? And what about a uniform? And of course, this might differ across uh, single gender and co-ed schools. So what would you advise for each of these? Yeah, I think that most co-ed schools, the, um, in terms of uni uniform, it's a fairly um, invisible transition because most schools do have um, a gender neutral option. That is that, you know, girls and boys are allowed to wear a trouser option. And um, so a trouser option is available to, to everybody. And I think that's, you know, particularly inclusive of um, our non-binary students who don't necessarily um, align themselves as either male or female. So having an option that is there for, for all of the school um, to use is, is perfect. Um, I think that in, in both in, in single gender schools as well, a gender neutral option um, should be available. And I suppose this does affect um, female single gender schools more than um, male single gendered schools. Um, and the feedback um, that I get from um, the lived experience of our um, students who transition to male it, whilst um, in a, a female single gender school is that quite often they're given the um, option of wearing um, the tracksuit bottoms, um, which is okay in the short term. Yes, that is definitely going to make somebody feel more comfortable than having to wear a skirt. But in the medium to long term, that doesn't really solve any issues and it really makes that student feel like they stand out. And it also um, makes them feel like they're not representing their, their school fully because they're not wearing a smart uniform like everybody, um, like every, all the um, girls are. So I, I really would um, encourage um, uh, the, the single gendered schools to consider a gender neutral option. Um, there are going to be um, other girls, um, there are going to be girls within the school who don't want to wear trousers. Um, that, that what happens then is that the, um, the trans boy doesn't feel like they stand out because girls are going to be wearing a trouser option too. So it's not like the one person in school wearing trousers. Girls are still going to wear skirts. It's not like so, suddenly no girls are going to want to wear skirts, but it, I think it's, it's good for everybody to have the option. So our research outlines how teachers can often at first be unsure about how to address gender diversity and they often cite a lack of education as one of the reasons for this. Do you find this yourself when you go to schools and what would you advise for schools in terms of educating staff about gender diversity? Yeah, I think that the, um, the, the terminology can be overwhelming for people. Um, there is a large amount of terminology um, out there. Not all of it is applicable to an Irish context, but, there are, but we see um, lots of words floating around and um, it can be a bit um, unnerving and overwhelming. So I think it really is important to upskill your, um, your staff uh, body and have a training. Um, uh, we at Tenney um, do a staff training um, and, um, and I'm available to do it. Uh, so, you know, please do get in touch. Um, it's free. I love doing the trainings and um, I, teachers always feel much more confident afterwards. And that's really what you're looking for. You want your teachers to feel confident um, in, um, in supporting um, your trans students. The, the majority of um, teachers really want to support their students and they just you know need to have um, the background knowledge where they feel like okay now i have a good foundation level of understanding and i know where to go from here and i suppose uh, would it be fair to say that, that that's ideally a proactive exercise not waiting until there's a young person who is coming out or transitioning at school yeah ideally and we do get a mixture um it is it is still mostly reactive, but we are getting um, schools who are thinking more and more about the possibility that could happen this year or the next year, which, which is brilliant. So yes, we would definitely um, prefer schools to come forward, any schools that haven't had our training yet or haven't had any training yet to, you know, to seek that training. It's always going to be beneficial 
Um, and, you know, it, it is going to affect your school at some point. And of course, this e-resource and the workbook accompanying it is available too for individual teachers to dip into um, and, you know, get a basic kind of 101 in terms of this before your training, perhaps, or in conjunction with your training. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is a really good starting level for somebody who is interested in the subject or possibly a guidance counsellor who has had a student disclosed to them and they're looking for more information. So this is a really good starting point. And the fact that you can kind of do the e-resource at your own pace, um, I think is a really good option as well. So it's not that you have to Give a, give a certain amount of time at a specific time. You can do a few minutes each evening and, and do it that way. And what about educating students? Yeah, I think that um, there's a ver good variety now these days. I think that a lot of young people um, really have a good understanding of um, gender diversity. Um, they use so many social media platforms and there's so much information um, and uh, celebrities in those um, social media platforms who are gender diverse. So I think a lot of young people really have a good grasp on it. Um, but of course, there are other students who don't. Um, and, and also the other thing is that if you have um, transgender students in your school, um, they want to see themselves represented in your school as well. So I think that all of those things culminated. I think it's really important that we start seeing those representations, you know, in um, FPHE, RSE, mm -hmm. and on the curriculum. Um, uh, Rory McBride has given some um, good resources in that for um, ideas on how to um, include that in, in the curriculum. But I think that um, young people, because they have such a good grasp, now they're looking to see that um, mirrored back to them and represented within the school system because they're seeing it outside of school. I think that it's really important that they start seeing it within school as well. So the, the final step of the checklist in section 11 speaks to ongoing supports for the young person who's transitioning. What would you advise in this regard? Yeah, this goes back to that first meeting again, and I think this is part of the transition plan. And I think it's important for the young person to decide who that go-to person is. You can call them a, a mentor or the go-to person. Um, and I suppose the school don't know who that, um, who that young person feels really comfortable with. And it's not necessarily the guidance counselor or the vice principal. It may well be, but it might be the biology teacher or the maths teacher. And I think that, you know, so as long as the teacher is, um, uh, wants to be included in that, um, and I hope that they would be, I think the student should um, be able to choose who that go-to person is. And then decide on um, how often that check-in is going to happen. Because, you know, in, in the immediate, um, when they are go going through their social transition, maybe they want to meet that person once a week or have that person approach them to just ask them if everything is okay once a week. But maybe after a couple of months, maybe they want it to be once a month or every six weeks. And then maybe after a few months, it's, you know, well, just check in with me once in a while. So I think it's really just gauging what that young person needs. You don't want it to be um, overwhelming either that somebody's constantly coming up and asking you, but you do want to know that you're um, well supported and that, uh, that, that the school really mean it as well. Yeah. So finally, you and Tani have a lot of experience in, in, in supporting young people in schools. What difference does attending to all of these aspects in the checklist and you know, more broadly in the e-resource make to these young people? It makes a huge difference. I mean, all, all the difference. A lot of anxieties for our um, trans and gender diverse young people, a lot of their anxieties do um, uh, center around school because they're in school for so many hours of the day and for so many years of their you know, teenage life. So it really does make a big difference. And you know, if they feel that they are uh, truly accepted and supported in school, it's it's making the difference of a lifetime it really is because they they carry that forward it's not just about their time in secondary school as probably all of us can you know attest to that, that those years were really important and it really does affect 
them into young adulthood and possibly into university or into their first you know um job so um yeah it if you can support your young person i can honestly say it's going to make um the world of difference they will remember it you know just as much as they remember the negative experiences that they had in school so yeah i can't um I can't highlight it enough. Yeah. That's all really clear and informative. Thanks so much, Anna. Yeah, you're very welcome. Um, just the starting from the, the beginning and ending on the same note, um, if you do nothing else other than listen to your, um, your young person who is wishing to socially transition, then that in itself will, will make a huge difference. They just need to know that they're really being listened to and that they're really being heard. And that is what makes all the difference. Thanks, Anna. Thank you so much.